Ladies and gentlemen, moving on, it would be plenary session one. Plenary session one, its theme is healthcare at a crossroad in a changing world. New demands for healthcare, health promotion, and health systems design. I have the honor to welcome the chair, Mr. Cote Luis. With your applauses, of course, please. The chair for plenary session one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we will uh, go to, uh, to plenary one, and uh, the topic, you know, is healthcare at the crossroad in a changing world, new demands for healthcare, health promotion, and health system design. And our first uh, speaker uh, will be Dr. Jose Gomez do Amaral. Uh, he is the president of the World Medical Association. Uh, before, he was a chair of the social, the social medical affairs of this organization and a council member since 2005. The World Medical Association was created to ensure the independence of physicians and to work for the highest possible standards of ethical behavior and care by physicians at all time. And Dr. José uh, Luis Gomez do Amaral is coming from Brazil, he is also uh, Portuguese and uh, he is an anesthesiologist and uh, don't worry, uh, the conference will be, uh, this presentation will be very interesting. Uh, he will, uh, he have also a career as a professor and he published many articles, uh, scientific articles, uh, during his uh, outstanding career. And uh, this evening, he will talk about social determinants of health, doctors and uh, hospitals. So I will invite uh, Dr. Jose Gomez do Amaral, uh, to come to the podium and to make his uh, conference about social determinants of health, doctors, and hospitals. I would like, like first please, to thank the organizers of the uh, 20th International Conference on Health Promoting Hospitals for having invited me to participate in this extraordinary event. So giving me the honor and privilege to be here with you. Enjoying the friendship of Taiwanese colleagues and the hospitality of the people of this country. 
and on behalf of the 99 national medical associations and the millions of physicians they represent to express our gratitude to the Medical Association of Taiwan for its dedication to the, our World Medical Association. I will summarize this presentation as follows. A brief story of uh, the Bay and its policies. The statement uh, of social determinants of health and uh, some considerations of how doctors and hospitals may tackle the social determinants of health. The World Medical Association, its vision, who are its members, its history, our fields of interest and activities, our governing bodies and policies. The World Medical Association is uh, the Global Federation of National Medical Associations representing the millions of physicians worldwide. Acting on behalf of patients and physicians, the WMA endeavors to achieve the highest possible standards of medical care, ethics, education, and health-related human rights for all people. The WMA has now 100 National Medical Association members, but individual doctors are also eligible for membership. The WMA was preceded by l'Association Professionnelle Internationale de Médecins, APA, founded in 1923 and integrated at that time by 23 national medical associations. But it was in Paris in 1947, under the presidence of Eugène Marquis from France, the World Medical Association had its first General Assembly. And since then, the WMA has been focused on ethical and clinical guidance, policy making, advocacy and representation. Here I show you a very incomplete list of some of the discussed topics. The fields of activities of WMA are reaching global consensus on medical ethics, guidance on problems on medical ethics, social medical affairs, support regional and national physician associations support the development of physicians, self-government, and representation to international organizations. The governing bodies of WMA gather in its General Assembly once a year. This year it will be close by. It will be in October in Bangkok, Thailand. The Council and Committees, they gather twice a year, and the Executive Committee more often on demand. Those are the three standing committees of WMA, the Medical Ethics Committee, Social Medical Affairs and Finance and Planning Committees. The offices of WMA are its President, the President-elect, and the immediate best president, the Chair and Vice-Chair of Council, the Treasurer, the Chairpersons of the three committees, and the Secretary-General. The Secretariat offices are set close to Geneva in Ferney-Voltaire, France. In many instances, as the Positive Practice Environment Campaign WMA has the partnership of dentists, nurses, physical therapists, and pharmacists, the World Alliance of Health Professionals. WMA keeps running a quite busy agenda on advocacy, publications, conferences, and courses. Those are examples of some of them. Policy-making activities are among the main activities of WMA. 
According to their scope, they are classified as resolution when specific and limited to region or time, statements or declaration, the highest ranking policies of WMA. Some examples of WMA landmark documents are the declarations of Geneva, Declaration of Helsinki, Declaration of Tokyo, Declaration of Lisbon, as many others. The WMA gathered last October in Montevideo in its 62nd General Assembly and at that time adopted the Statement on Social Determinants of Health. That was an initiative of the British Medical Association headed by Sir Michael Marmot, today Chair of the Social Medical Affairs Committee. The Social Determinants of Health, this statement. Social Determinants of Health are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and the societal influences on these conditions. Social determinants of health are major influences on quality of life, including good health and length of disability free life expectancy. While healthcare will attempt to pick up the pieces and repair the damage caused by premature ill health, is, it is this social, cultural, environmental, economic and other factors that are the major causes of rates of illnesses, and in particular the magnitude of health inequalities. Historically, the primary role of doctors and other healthcare professionals has been to treat the sick, a vital and much cherished role in all societies. To a lesser extent, extent, healthcare professionals have dealt with individual exposures to the causes of disease, smoking, obesity, and alcohol and chronic disease, for example. This familiar aspect of lifestyle can be taught of as proximate cause of diseases. The work on social determinants goes far beyond this focus on approximate causes, considers the causes of the causes. A social determinant of health approach addresses the causes of these causes and how do they contribute to the social inequalities in health. It focuses not only on individual behavior, but six, the social and economical circumstances that give rise to premature ill health. In many societies, unhealthy behavior follow the social gradient. The lower people are in the social economic uh, hierarchy, the more they smoke, the worse their diet, and the less physical activity they engage in. A major but not only, not only cause of social distribution of these causes is the level of education. Other specific examples are uh, price and availability regarding to alcohol consumption, taxation, package labeling, bans on advertisement, smoking in public places in the case of uh, tobacco consumption. The voice of medical profession has been most important in these examples of tackling the causes of the causes. 
There is a growing movement globally that seeks to address gross inequalities in health and length of life through action on the social determinants of health. This movement has involved the World Health Organization, several national governments, civil society organizations, and academics. There is much that can happen within the practice of medicine that can contribute directly and through working with other sectors. The WMA should gather examples of good practice from its members and promote further work in this area. But us, doctors and hospitals, what should be our role in this context? Integrated in the community, doctors and hospitals, they come to care people, but they bring also change. Direct healthcare is and will be also the center of medical profession and hospital activity. It would not be needed to say that healthcare is itself a direct determinant of health since equitable access to assistance has utmost importance to assure recovery and return to normal life. Nevertheless, we shall recognize that it is mandatory looking beyond direct care and tackle the causes of poor health. I picked up just two examples of institutions which could very well illustrate the vast range of possibilities of initiatives tackling social determinants of health, not leaving the primary scope of the institution in second plan. The first example is the General Hospital of Pira Jussara, it's a very complicated name in Portuguese. And the second one is the Israeli Hospital Albert Einstein, both in the same city in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The first one. Hospital Geral, General Hospital of Pira Jussara. It's a public hospital. Its administration and operation the responsibility of the faculties of the Federal University of São Paulo, Unifesp. It is a 282 bed hospital which services and encompasses all the listed specialties here. It is a public hospital built to assist one of the poorest communities of the state. Even so, its activities are driven by the best standards of practice because there are no double standards of medical care but the best one. And that includes not just compliance with the best national and international clinical practices but also environmental sustainability as those three green awards of uh, hospital friend of the environment and the one below them, which is uh, Free Mercury Hospital. Before the hospital came to this community, the situation was unbearable. Waste directed to living spaces. But the hospital needed an appropriate sewer system. It had to be built to serve the hospital. And it was so built, but to serve the hospital and to serve the community. And after the hospital, the area started to be urbanized. Children used to spend their times in the streets where violence was a common place. Thirteen years after the situation changed, changed substantially, educational and recreational activities were offered to around 
1,000 children from the beginning of the hospital activities. The hospital changed the health status of the, that community through good clinical practice, to good clinical care, but improving living standards. Many among those children, children's relatives work now in the hospital. Almost, of the, almost a half of the workforce are local residents. Almost 700 of them were promoted as being qualified by educational programs in the hospital. But now I will talk about an institution which seems to be, at the first glance, totally different. This is the Albert Einstein Hospital, a first-class private hospital comparable with the best in the developed world. Driven by a non-profit Brazilian Jewish organization, its activities are oriented according to the values expressed by four Hebraic words. Refua, Mitzvot, Shinuch, Tzedakah which mean health, good actions, education, social justice, and solidarity. The Our Einstein Hospital also participates in governmental programs, as those listed below. Uh, I would like to mention among them the Hospital Moises Deutsch, built also in another poor and highly populated area of the city and organized within the same frame project. I just showed you the one of the Pirajusana Hospital. This initiative began in 2008. This slide shows you the number of people and families enrolled and assisted by the family health teams and at the ambulatory units. The hospital which is a reference for 6,000 people, has received last year more than 200,000 patients for emergency consultation. More than 15,000 of them were admitted. More than 4,000 women delivered in that hospital. But now I will tell you the last history of this presentation very close to the high-class neighborhood where Albert Einstein Hospital is situated, another highly dense populated area developed, the community of Paraisopolis. Paraisopolis is a word in Portuguese which ironically means the city of paradise. That's Paraisopolis a community of uh, 50,000 people. And the administration of the hospital understood they were, had a role there. They went there firstly to run a healthcare program, but also because they realized they could change and they should change the social background of Paraisopolis. This slide summarizes the areas of intervention in this community. They started with prenatal care, the conditions people are born, followed by obstetrical care and pediatrics, they grow, and through education they offer to the community into the education and offer to the community better work opportunities. Starting with prenatal care, this initiative assists around 500 women a year. Last year, they assisted 540 women. Many of them live in particularly difficult situations. 
But besides obstetrical and medical care, the initiative provides educational, psychological, and nutritional support to the assisted women. Those numbers refer to obstetrical care deliveries and those nutritional assistance. This is the number of pediatric consultations. And through pediatric consultations to monitoring the uh, social uh, situation in the community, it was possible to organize a program for prevention and control of accidents among many of programs developed in this community. And the results are impressive, decreasing the number of accidents in children. But educational initiatives does not limit to health-related activities, extending qualifications in many other areas. 271 people from the community were so professionally trained. And differently from what is seen in wealthy in, in units set in wealthy areas of the city, those built in poor areas, they have in their workforce expressive number of local residents. We shall extend the role of medical profession. We shall extend the role of medical profession from repairing people's poor health and involve themselves more with the root causes of premature ill health. We shall use hospital means and medical competences to identify health determinants and evaluate their impact showing evidences of how the change of social context affects health and effectiveness of healthcare. We shall monitor progress and get deeply involved in advocacy using the evidence and influence as community leaders to shape social justice. And so doing, real progress will certainly result. Thank you very much, Dr. Jose Luis Gomez de Lamar, for this very inspiring presentation. And uh, now uh, we will have our second speaker, interdisciplinary one. Uh, our next speaker is related with the American Art Association and uh, RTI International, Dr. Ken Labresh. And the mission of the American Art Association, it's interesting, the mission of this organization is to build healthier lives free of cardiovascular diseases and stroke. That single purpose drives how they are doing. And also, RTE International, if you are wondering, is an independent non-profit institute that provides research, technical services to government and commercial clients worldwide. The mission is to improve the human condition by turning knowledge into practice. And uh, Dr. Labresh is a senior fellow of this organization. He has more than 30 years of experience in the medical field, uh, where he was uh, in zero clinical and leadership background in academic medicine, private practice, quality improvement, health policy research. And he received the distinguished Leadership Award from the American Art Association and also the National Philanthropy Award in the United States. Uh, he has a particular idea uh, at the beginning. He was an engineer and after that he became a medical doctor. He is a specialist in cardiology and he will uh, talk to us uh, this uh, evening about what uh, Jorgen Pelikan uh, signaled at the beginning of the, of the uh, conference about the non-communicable uh, disease and he will give us his thoughts about uh, how we can address uh, this uh, challenge uh, and based on the experience that he has in the United States scene. So I will invite uh, Dr. Uh, Labrache uh, to the podium and to make his uh, presentation.
the organizing committee to the bureau of health promotion here in taiwan and i want to thank them for their hospitality over the time that i've been here prior to the conference i've had a chance to meet some of you and have genuinely enjoyed the experience so over the next half hour or so we'll talk about a few things related to non-communicable diseases i want to spend a little bit of time just setting context i will speak mainly about cardiovascular disease so i need to justify why i'm going to do that when in fact there are other diseases even for a cardiologist i do recognize there are other diseases besides cardiovascular disease and so we'll talk about that a little bit and then i want to focus on the u.s approach to the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease and more specifically some of the work that we've done in applying evidence-based medicine to the prevention and to the acute treatment of cardiovascular disease and i think there may be some reasons to think particularly based on some of the work i've heard about going on here in taiwan and stroke care for some measure of optimism in all of this at the end i think it would be important to talk about when we implement evidence-based medicine what's the relationship between the processes that we do in the hospital and our medical practices to the outcome of our patients which ultimately is the most important part of all of this so to begin with i think you're pretty familiar with this already that non-communicable diseases are a major health issue the united nations recognized this in september the second meeting of the united nations in its history that related to health related issues the first was with the communicable diseases we see on the slide on the left and as one looks at these red bars by far the largest is cardiovascular disease so this represents an enormous burden and an accelerating problem worldwide exacerbated by the related epidemic of obesity and concomitant diabetes and so there are a lot of forces going on i thought this slide would be particularly appropriate for this audience in that the asia pacific reason region has the highest burden of cardiovascular disease in the world it's good to be number one about some things i'm a boston red sox fan so i have eternal optimism but this is not one of those things in in this part of the world stroke is predominantly the issue as opposed to myocardial infarction but certainly both are present so as we think about these major non-communicable diseases we know that they have a common set of risk factors so for heart disease and stroke diabetes cancer and chronic lung disease tobacco both secondhand exposure to tobacco and smoking and other use of tobacco products are major causative risk factors and so if we approach smoking cessation in general and preventing exposure we will prevent substantial number of each of the four major non-communicable diseases the three diseases heart disease diabetes and stroke it share the common risk factors on healthy diet physical and activity and excessive use of alcohol one of the things that's begun to happen very interestingly in the united states is the recognition of the common roots of cancer diabetes and heart disease so the american heart association the american diabetes association and the american cancer society are increasingly working together in joint projects designed to reduce these common set of risk factors so heart disease and stroke are still the leading killers in the united states we've had an epidemic of heart disease for most of my life and i won't tell you how long that is but it's more than a half century it causes one in every three deaths in the united states there are two million heart attacks and strokes each year resulting in 800,000 deaths about two-thirds of the heart attacks and strokes are recurrent events so they occur in people that have already had either a stroke or a heart attack and go on to have another the most common cause of death in patients who survive an acute stroke is a myocardial infarction over the next five years and so they are actually markers for a common disease of atherosclerotic vascular disease they are also the greatest contributor to racial disparities 
and particularly in life expectancy. And it is unlikely we'll ever close all of our issues around disparities um, by dealing only with the social determinants, although they're extraordinarily important. But we also need to be able to effectively treat risk factors and prevent the development of risk factors. So there are a number of factors that affect health. We just heard an excellent presentation talking about socioeconomic factors. One of the things that I know as, as, a, as a clinician uh, looking at the top of this pyramid is that counseling and education to produce lifestyle change sounds like an incredibly good idea. It is incredibly ineffective. People find it difficult to change the way they behave, the way they live, and as long as the easiest thing for them to do is to keep doing what they are, have been doing, they will do so. And so one of the keys in changing lifestyles is to make the context of individuals' default decisions the easiest thing to do. So if the decision, the easiest decision is a healthy decision, we will reduce uh, risk and the development of risk factors. I would have the uh, opportunity to uh, visit Spain last summer. And one of the things that I found very striking is the structure in, in Spanish cities. Uh, spent some time in Bilbao where there are these gorgeous walking paths and bike paths along the river by the Guggenheim. People are out at night, they're socializing with each other. They eat very small portions of healthy food and consume a little bit of red wine, which is probably okay. Um, and all of that combines to reduce risk, and, and it wasn't really until I was there that I understood the, the value of the Mediterranean diet. It's, it's much more than diet. The point being, when one lives in that kind of environment, the easy thing to do, the natural thing to do, is also the healthy thing to do. And so we need to create more of those kinds of environments in our cities, in our countrysides. It's hard to get children to exercise if they have no safe place to do it. Uh, clinical interventions are effective, but um, are expensive and impact only a portion of the population, those with already developed risk factors. So, here's some good news. Uh, over the period between 1980 and 2000 in the United States, we saw a 50% reduction in heart disease deaths. In fact, if one looks from about 1950 forward, there has been a, uh, a gradual decline in the rate of death until rather recently. This very interesting article from 2007 from the New England Journal of Medicine tried to parse out the various factors that contribute to this reduction in heart disease deaths. So on the left side of the slide are the clinical intervention and of interest Clinical interventions and risk factor reductions which are really the public health initiatives to prevent the development of risk factors and to treat population-wide risk factors like cholesterol levels and blood pressure. Each account for about 50% of the decline in mortality. So as one looks at this treatment of uh, established hypertension or cholesterol plays an important role, about equal to the treatment of uh, the secondary prevention treatments after people have had an acute event. Interestingly enough, acute treatment, and in the United States we spend enormous amounts of time, energy, and money in treating acute stroke and acute myocardial infarction. I was an interventional cardiologist for 25 years, spent a lot of time and effort treating uh, something that easily could have been prevented. We estimate about 80% of all heart attacks can be prevented. Uh, but yet, uh, a lot of late nights putting in very expensive hardware to people's arteries was the way that we've chosen to uh, address this issue. And so one of the lessons from the U.S. is you can't treat your way out of the epi epi epidemic of cardiovascular disease. There aren't enough resources in the world to be able to do that. And so unless we get very serious about prevention, preventing the development of risk factors and treating risk factors, um, we will never escape this plague of non-communicable diseases. So on the risk factor side, if you look at the numbers, 24% reduction by uh, treating, uh, reducing the levels of cholesterol in the population, you would think that actually this would be a much more powerful indicator. A recent study by the UK demonstrated more like a 60-40 split. And so what's the problem here? Well, look at these last two bars on the right. 
Um, and this was back in 2000. So overweight and obesity, which is now a majority phenomenon. If you are a normal weight in the United States, you are a minority, uh, which is really a pretty astounding statement. And with that has become an epidemic of diabetes. I'm old enough as a clinician to remember the type 2 diabetes, we used to call adult onset diabetes. You never saw it until people reached you know, 30, 40, 50 years old. They tended to be a little overweight. Now I'm working on a project with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to reduce risk factors in children. And one of the major causes of risk in children is obesity and diabetes is now developing in teens and preteens. Type 2 insulin resistant diabetes related to obesity. That is a major concern and may suggest that our downward decline of, of uh, heart disease deaths uh, is at an end. And we now expect, uh, actually, there was a New England Journal article about four or five years ago suggesting that the current generation of children may be the first generation in the history of my country to have a lower life expectancy than the generation that preceded it. That is a stunning statement. And since I have children, I think about that a lot. So what are we doing about all of this? So here is a new program um, led by the, our Department of Health and Human Services. It's a public-private sector partnership called Million Hearts. The goal of this is to prevent a million heart attacks and stroke over the next five years, so by 2017, having a million fewer heart attacks and stroke than otherwise would have happened. And the plan here is to reduce the number of people who need treatment, to improve the quality of treatment for those who need it, and to, and the, the um, language here I think is very interesting, maximize current investments in cardiovascular health. We have a sort of unique problem in the United States. We spend an enormous amount of money in healthcare and we don't get particularly good returns for that. And so for us, putting more resources into healthcare makes no sense. Using resources more effectively makes enormous sense. And so this program is designed to address those issues. So the key components are both a community prevention component, reducing the need for treatment by reducing tobacco use and improving nutrition, a lot of focus on reducing sodium and uh, eliminating trans fats, uh, the same things that you've seen in the, in the WHO uh, recommendations. For clinical prevention, improving uh, the use of ABCs, aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking, uh, simplifying measure, and improving uh, our control of those issues. The use of health information technology, we're probably behind most of you in the world in the use of electronic health records. We're rapidly um, increasing the rate of adoption, and one of the projects that I work on is helping uh, primary care practices to do that and uh, redesigning the way in which care is delivered. We'll talk a good deal more about that in the second half of this discussion. So for tobacco control, some of the major issues that seem to be extremely effective are creating smoke-free public places and, and workplaces and increasing the cost of tobacco. Policy issues that make the easy choice not to smoke, it's difficult to smoke, and that's one of the things that will persuade people to quit, and it's far more effective than the first bullet here, just warning people about the harms of tobacco. I spent 25 years doing that. I can tell you it's not always terribly effective. And so here is a very nice example from New York City. I mean, this is New York City. Um, and during the course of between 2002 and 2010, um, with the policies put into place, there are now nearly half million fewer smokers in New York City than there were. So starting here in 2002, there was an increase in cigarette tax by both the city and by New York State. The second piece of this, that produced a significant reduction of a couple of percentage points, and then legislation to create a smoke-free workplace, and part of that is uh, aimed at, at restaurant workers and those that work in bars. Because somehow tobacco and alcohol just seem to go together. One wonders if the tobacco companies won't just mix them together in some product, and so we can you know, eliminate the need to have to do two different things. 
Um, the next thing um, that was done was to provide free nicotine patches to allow people, make it easier for people to quit. To, to quit. And that resulted in a reduction of, of another percent or two, so about a 3% reduction of those three uh, initiatives. The media campaign about why it's bad to smoke came much later and produced about another percent. And then finally, another series of major tax hikes. And so now the smoking rate in New York City is 14%. The national smoking rate across the United States is about 22%. Uh, so this is a stunning achievement. It had full support, and I must say rather vigorous support, from the mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, um, who actually put some of his own money into this project. It's nice when you have that much money to be able to do that. Okay, for reducing sodium intake, one of the things that we know about sodium is that almost all the sodium we consume is in process and prepared food. Only about 8% of the sodium that we consume comes from the salt shaker on the table. And so the way in which we will reduce sodium consumption is by dealing with the issues uh, with those companies that prepare and process food. Uh, we will be tracking that. Our National Health and Nutrition Survey will now be collecting information about sodium consumption, lots of public and, and public professional education, but ultimately this will come to changing the food industry, which is a major contributor to obesity uh, into the increase in sodium consumption. Finally, uh, trans fats. Uh, what it comes down to is that there's no particular reason why we should have trans fats in our food, period. Uh, it doesn't cost any more to have foods without the trans fats. They don't taste any different. Um, there's really no reason it should happen. Again, this is an issue that ultimately the food industry will deal with. The FDA did require food labeling and with fat, in a public uh, education campaign, our trans fat consumption has been decreased by half. That still leaves another half, and until we get trans fats out of our foods, uh, this will continue to be a problem, it will continue to have a very adverse effect on uh, the components of uh, lipids in our blood. So, uh, we've talked already about the ABCs and the importance of those. Uh, the, our estimate is that with conservative application of these, we can save 100,000 lives a year. And this is why we think that. If you look at these graphs on the, um, on the horizontal axis, is the percent of the population that have uh, reduced their smoking, have blood pressure controlled, cholesterol controlled, or an aspirin prophylaxis and are eligible for that. And then based on that, on the uh, vertical axis is the number of lives saved. So if we could just control 90%, the blood pressure in 90% of our population that needs blood pressure control, we would save 75,000 lives a year. You say that's not possible. There is an integrated health system very large in our country, Kaiser Permanente, that is already at a 90% control rate. And so that by itself will get us very close to 100,000 lives. So we think this is very doable. The projections are that if we reach about 65% control, we'll easily reach this goal of 100,000 and that's about half of the overall goal. So, lots of things that need to be done in the medical system. We've talked about the role of clinicians. One of the things that we really underutilize in the United States is the resource of pharmacists. Uh, again, having been in Europe, I've seen that pharmacists are actually part of the healthcare team. They actually know stuff other than how to retail. In the U.S., pharmacists are pretty much retailers. And that's something that really needs to change. It's an enormous waste of a talented resource. And so part of this campaign will be to energize this group. So there are lots of uh, organizations that are part of this. I've highlighted the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services as lead organizations, but there are a lot of other governmental organizations and a number of private sector organizations, including the American Heart Association, um, the American Medical Association, a number of professional societies, um, and, uh, and particularly pharmacists, and at the bottom, the Y, which is probably our best resource in communities. The YMCA, the YWCA, uh, we made them non-gender, and we just call it the Y. Uh, but it's where people in communities go to exercise. And so now, uh, for the remainder of this discussion, I want to talk about our American Heart Association program that we started in Massachusetts a dozen years ago. 
Uh, and the goal of this was to improve acute and preventive care in patients hospitalized with heart disease or stroke. So this includes acute coronary syndromes, heart failure, uh, and acute stroke. And the goal of this is to, to move from this place of efficacy. Now for years and years we've been very good as, as the American Heart Association in generating guidelines. That's the role of efficacy. What does the evidence tell, tell us? Go do it. And guess what? People weren't doing it. In fact, they tended to fall in this pit, uh, this gap between what we know and what we do. And the bridge over that is building effective systems, both in practices and in hospitals. It takes leadership and culture to make that happen. And so this program, Get With the Guidelines, was designed to do exactly that. It relies on, on engaging stakeholders, key opinion leaders, uh, and, and in turn, recruiting hospitals with a consensus that this is an important thing for us to do. Some breakthrough series collaboratives. This uses exactly the same model. I've been a member of the uh, uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement faculty for the, most of the last decade, and we really used a lot of those techniques with interactive learning sessions and sharing best practices. Hospitals educate other hospitals. Everybody learns, everybody teaches. It turns out to be very effective, particularly coupled with old technology, in that we have an online patient management tool, which is a data collection tool where we can collect the appropriate data from patients uh, at the point of care. Um, we can, hospitals can generate reports, benchmarked against their uh, uh, comparable hospitals in their region throughout the United States in clinical decision support so that right when the patient is being cared for, when the data is being entered, they can get reminders about what the guidelines say. And what turned out to be probably one of the more effective parts of this is American Heart Association <laughs> recognition. Those of you that, have, that work in hospitals and have worked um, on quality improvement know that you tend not to see the hospital C-suite folks, the CEO, the chief nursing officer, uh, the people in management uh, a lot in your day-to-day -day activities. Those programs that have that are very effective, but it's uncommon. One of the things that we found is that when we deliver a plaque for recognition of participation at a high level, we immediately find ourselves in the boardroom with the mahogany table, meeting with the president of the hospital. And this then engages leadership, provides the support for the teams that are doing the uh, improvement. So it becomes a very important piece. This is a brief look at what the tool looks like. Uh, at the bottom uh, right is an example of the kind of prompts uh, uh, that are provided. So one doesn't need to remember the guidelines. Because stroke is such an important issue for most of you, I thought I'd show you some data about our results from Get With The Guidelines Stroke. This was started in 2003. Uh, we now have almost 1,700 hospitals and we have enrolled two million patients in the stroke registry. Uh, we look at acute interventions, so the use of thrombolytic therapy for acute ischemic stroke, um, early antithrombotic agent, primarily aspirin, and prophylaxis for deep vein thrombosis, since many of these patients are immobile. Uh, and for, uh, at discharge or later in the um, hospitalization, being discharged on an antithrombotic agent, if patients have atrial fibrillation because of this relationship, the development of stroke and coagulation becomes very important. Treatment with statins for lipid disorders and smoking cessation. So those are the measures. And if you look at this first column, the baseline numbers show that <coughs> neurologists are actually very good about giving antithrombotic agents, always have been. And so their numbers were pretty high to start with, uh, around 90% or so. Uh, IV uh, uh, TPA, uh, thrombolytic agents, is a much more complex issue. And when we started, only about 40% of eligible patients were getting lytic agents. Now if you go all the way to the right side, over a course of about four or five years, we got a 30 percentage point improvement, and now about 75%, and even with more recent data, we're now up to about 85% of eligible stroke patients are getting acute thrombolysis. Uh, the other measures are all now you know, above 85%, with many at 90, 98%. Um, the arrow points out the incremental change. 
noticed that the small numbers were associated with baseline performance that was around 90%. It turns out that the amount, the percent of the distance between the goal of 100% and where you are is about the same amount of work whether you're at 40% and you close half that gap to, to 70% or if you're at 90% and you close half that gap to 95%. It takes a lot of work to go from 90 to 95 percent and create these very reliable systems. And so that's one of the ways we think about this. For those of you that are more visual, this is just an example of these measures plotted out uh, year by year over a five year period with baseline being on the left of each of these. Um, one of the things that I would point out is that with each year that goes by, we continue to see improvement. So a lot of improvement in the first year, but hospitals continue to improve. This tends to imply that the longer you stay and get with the guidelines, the better you'll do. Now, I've submitted several manuscripts. We've done a lot of publishing with this work, and I can tell you that if there are any peer reviewers in the audience, I like you all a lot. There were times when I wasn't so sure about that, because one of the things I used to hear from peer reviewers, well, this is observation. How do you know there's any cause and effect between your program and the results. Now, some people would say that if you can improve performance measure by 30 percentage points in a couple of years, that's pretty good circumstantial evidence. But we really needed to come up with something better. So one of the unique things about Get With The Guidelines is we continue to add hospitals. So every year, every month, there are more and more hospitals. A few hospitals drop out. We've looked at that. Hospitals that drop out are about average performers. They're not particularly stars, nor are they poor performers. So that doesn't seem to influence performance very much. And then we did this multivariable logistic regression model of hospital characteristics. This sort of thing is very common in this kind of observational data, looking at hospital characteristics like bed size. Are they teaching hospital, their geography, uh, their volume of cases? Uh, these are commonly done. What hadn't been done, to our knowledge, before is using two new variables. And we could do this because of this pattern of hospitals entering over time. So for the secular trend, we used as a variable the calendar time. So what year, what years were you involved in the program? So this was looking from 2003 to 2008. So if you entered later, was your performance better than when you entered earlier? And in fact, we did find an association, an independent association with the time, so secular trends are real, not a surprise. What we also found, much to our delight, um, and I really wanted to send a letter to each of the reviewers, but I didn't, uh, that time and get with the guidelines is the most independent, significant association between performance and any of these variables. And so this now really settled that argument, and I must say that getting our manuscripts published has become a whole lot easier. So why do we think this works? Well, a lot of it is that the measures that we use, and we're very fortunate in cardiovascular care to have very large clinical trials with very tight relationships between the processes that we work on and patient outcomes. We believe that concurrent data capture is important. Uh, with clinical decision support. And there's a lot of literature about the presence of decision support at the, at the point of care. And as I've already mentioned, recognition and its ability to engage leadership also plays an important role. So uh, the last part of this then is what about the relationship between these processes and outcomes? This was an early paper from Intermountain Healthcare in Utah. This is really an extraordinary integrated healthcare system um, we struggle a lot because we have so many different insurance systems and so many different databases. These folks have an integrated database that captures basically all of their information, both inpatient information and office follow-up. And so they were able to look longitudinally at their patients. And so they did, as we were doing, their patients with coronary disease, uh, a quality improvement effort around aspirin, these inhibitors, statins, beta blockers, and warfarin for folks with atrial fibrillation. Familiar measures, the same ones that we use. They were able, able to relatively quickly get patients discharged on those medicines. And then they looked a year later and they found that 90% of patients that were started in the hospital, paired with an acute event, continued to take those medications. There are a number of observational studies that show exactly the same data. We also know from other longitudinal studies that when you start a statin, 
or um, an ACE inhibitor in the outpatient arena, about 50% of patients will be off those drugs within the first year. So adherence is a major problem. And so starting in the hospital seems to be an important teachable moment. And I think this demonstrates that. The other thing that it demonstrates is that in the subpopulation of coronary disease patients who have heart failure, they demonstrate a 23% reduction in one year mortality. 9% uh, reduction in readmission rate. Even in the non-heart failure population that has a lower baseline mortality, 20% reduction in one year mortality. So if you do it, if you get it right in the hospital, patients stay on the medication and they live longer. Threat always helps. Any intervention, right? threat of intervention. And so this just illustrates, um, there are lots of clinical trials that demonstrate these kinds of relative risks for aspirin beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, about 25%, lipid lowering about 30%, and from the more recent trials with more intense statin use, dropping LDL to around 70, you get about another 16%. So if you apply that, and the data also demonstrates that these are independent and additive changes. So if you take the average 20% event rate in patients over the two years following discharge for myocardial infarction, and you serially apply these, inter um, these interventions and, and their reduction in risk, when and the one ends up with a, a two-year event rate of 5%, that's a 75% reduction in relative risk, a 15% reduction in absolute risk. What that means is that for every six patients treated, one patient will have, one, you will avert one cardiovascular death, one myocardial infarction, or one stroke. That is very powerful therapy. There are very few interventions in medicine that have numbers needed to treat under 10, even under 20. We generally consider 50 to be a reasonable kind of number, so this is really kind of extraordinary. And it's one of the things about cardiovascular care. We have a lot in our armamentarium if we use it. So just briefly, this is an example from heart failure. This is an outpatient um, initiatives over two years uh, using some of the same measures, ACE inhibitors, and these just show data baseline one year and two years, the use of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, anticoagulation, facial fibrillation. The next two are devices, cardiac resynchronization therapy and implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Like I told you, we love our technology. Uh, and then finally, heart failure education, something a little less expensive and high tech turns out to be rather important. And so then if one looks at, uh, this is a somewhat complicated slide. So uh, on the left are each of these interventions listed. And then we look at the percent mortality over this 24 month period for those patients that were for the first row on an ACE inhibitor compared to those that were not on an ACE inhibitor. And you can see, and same for beta blockers and all these other interventions. For ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, consistent with the clinical literature and clinical trial literature, you reduce mortality over two years by about 50%. Uh, for anticoagulation, uh, for the devices and heart failure education, you reduce mortality by about a third. Very powerful interventions, aldosterone antagonists. You can see by the wide confidence intervals, there are a very small number of patients who are actually were eligible uh, for that intervention. So that's the only one where one didn't see anything. So again, we demonstrate that when we apply these processes and practice as a matter of routine, we reduce mortality rates, even in heart failure where the mortality rate is quite high. So to bring all of this together, CVD patients would have better long-term outcomes when secondary prevention, prevention measures are started in the hospital. We know that it enhances long-term uh, adherence, at least over the next year. It tends to increase patients' conviction that the therapy is important. What that means is that when they come back to the office following their hospital discharge, one doesn't need to spend a lot of time convincing them that they should be taking these therapies because the response they will give you is, I was in the hospital. If this was so important, why wasn't it started when I was there by the specialist? And there's no good answer for that. 
And so I think that has a lot to do with why patients stay on these drugs, so that when one sees them in the office, then you can focus on, since we have, often have these folks on multiple drugs, how that happens. Uh, how are you taking your medicines and helping people with patterns of medication use so that they can better it, adhere. So it's all about the how-to because they're already convinced about the what. It needs to be reinforced, but it doesn't require a lot of time. So in the United States, like other countries in the world, uh, we are in the midst, midst, of an, uh, midst of an epidemic of non-communicable disease, which is worsened by rising rates of obesity. We fear that the decline in mortality that we have seen uh, is now being reversed. Multiple efforts to address risk in the community in clinical settings can make a difference both in the quality and the quantity of lives of our citizens. And I think that's true for all of us. I think together we can learn from each other as we undertake efforts to defeat non-communicable diseases. I'll look forward to learning from all of you over the next couple of days. And I hope that you've had an opportunity to learn something from this presentation. Thank you for your attention. So please, one more round of applause to our speakers and let's welcome the chair and our two speakers up on stage, please, because Director General, Ms. Churchwati has gifts for our chair and our speakers. Please, let's welcome them up on stage once again. Director General, Ms. Trusavati would like to thank our chair and our two speakers in person. And a token of appreciation is the gift that she's about to give to them. Thank you for your applauses, yes. Thank you to our chair. And now to our two speakers for their contribution, for their participation in our HPH conference, Plenary Session 1. Thank you so much. Please, let's pose for a group photo. Director General, Ms. Chushu T, and our chair and our two speakers of Plenary Session 1. Thank you so much. Please, your applause. So ladies and gentlemen, we have just completed plenary session one and moving on, I believe everyone should be hungry by now. For your information, the welcome reception, which is dinner, will be served at third floor banquet hall. This is third floor right here, okay. So please enjoy your dinner and some housekeeping items. Some housekeeping items. If you need any assistance for the following couple of days, you could seek help from our staff any staff with the Bureau of Health Promotion logo, they've got the logo tagged right here. Okay. And the poster thesis vote ends at 1500 on the 13th of April. The ballot is in your handbag. The top three winners will be awarded on the closing ceremony on 13th of April. So thank you again once again. Please enjoy your dinner. Welcome to reception at third floor, banquet hall. Thank you.